Hey Starship Addicts, my name is Zach Golden, and welcome to another CSI Starbase Deep Dive Investigation. As I'm sure most of you watching this have probably heard by now, SpaceX has finally completed its first ever 33 engine static fire test on the orbital launch vehicle. Well, actually it was only 31 engines, but Starship's inaugural launch now appears to be just around the corner. With that being said, I think that today is the perfect time to talk to you all about an incredibly important topic as it relates to the first orbital test flight. Structural verification testing. Sounds pretty exciting, right? No? Well, imagine you're part of a crew of astronauts sitting inside of a spacecraft soaring high above the Earth, traveling at a speed of more than 40,000 kilometers per hour, hurtling towards the landing zone back on the ground. The only thing standing between you and certain disaster is the structural integrity of the spacecraft you are strapped down inside of. The loads and stresses that a spacecraft must endure during launch, re-entry, and unexpected emergency scenarios are immense and could potentially compromise the structural integrity of the vehicle, putting the lives of you and the rest of the crew at risk. This is why structural verification testing is crucial in the design and development of crew-rated space vehicles. Right, looks good. Come on. By subjecting mock-ups and prototypes to simulated loads, engineers can assess the strength and durability of the materials and components used in the vehicle. This gives them the ability to confidently ensure that the structure can withstand the various loads and stresses it will encounter during both normal and abnormal operational conditions. The results of these tests allow engineers to make any necessary modifications to the design in order to guarantee the safety of everyone on board before the vehicle is licensed for crewed missions. In short, Structural verification testing is the first line of defense against disaster, ensuring that the crewed spacecraft can endure the harsh environment of space and complete their mission safely. Now, of course, we all know that SpaceX is nowhere near the point of seeking to obtain crew rating for this vehicle. But this doesn't mean that structural verification testing is any less important for the phase that they are in currently. SpaceX has a long list of important goals that they plan to achieve in the year 2023, and whether or not they are able to accomplish these goals is highly dependent on the result of the testing that they have been performing over the past three years. The first and most important mission is to get this massive vehicle off of the pad in one piece. If the Starship were to suffer a rapid unscheduled disassembly while fully fueled on the pad or shortly after liftoff, the results would be catastrophic and could set the program back by at least a year, if not longer. The level of devastation that would occur as a result of such an event would be on a scale that we have really never seen before in the modern spaceflight era. In my opinion, the second highest priority is for Starship to begin putting payload into orbit ASAP. Preferably yesterday if any of you happen to have access to a time machine. The reason for this urgency is because Starship is the only vehicle capable of deploying SpaceX's version 2 Starlink satellites at the rate needed to complete their constellation of 42,000 satellites. The longer it takes to begin performing Starlink missions, the longer it will be until the Starship program becomes self-sustaining and stops appearing as a net loss on SpaceX's financial balance sheet. After analyzing all the evidence that was available to us, we have come to the conclusion that the odds of SpaceX achieving this particular goal in the year 2023 are getting slimmer with each passing day. There's no easy way to say this, but our agents have come to the conclusion that the current version of the Starship cargo variant is structurally compromised. You may have noticed by now that both Ship 24 and Ship 25 have had the sliding doors for their Starlink PEZ dispensers welded shut. Both ships have also had covers installed over the top of those doors in order to prevent what would surely be a collapse of the payload section of the Starship during the Max-Q phase of flight. Over the last few months, we have been focusing our efforts on investigating this situation so we can explain to all of you Starship fans how and why this major issue occurred and what SpaceX is doing to resolve it. In the process, we came to the realization that never in the history of spaceflight has there been this level of access to the development process of an orbital class launch vehicle. As a result, we have decided that the best way to cover this topic is by analyzing the entire history of Starship verification testing, going all the way back to Mark 1, and then applying what we learned along the way to better understand how SpaceX ended up in this predicament. Essentially, this multi-part episode is the Starship equivalent of the everyday astronaut's Soviet rocket engine family tree. As you can imagine, this is a pretty difficult topic to cover alone. 
So today, I'm going to get some assistance from one of our special agents who knows far more about this topic than I do. He should be here now, so why don't we head upstairs and meet him? Jax? Hey, Jax. Agent Giuliani, huh? Have you seen Jax? Oh, uh, not yet. They actually just finished uploading him into the system. Might take a bit to boot up, though. SpaceX still rationing our power consumption until they activate the new three-phase system from Brownsville in the production site area. There's your activation switch right there. All right, well, uh, let me get a glass of water on the rocks. Sure thing, boss. All right, well, I guess we'll start without him. So the process of structural verification testing is not new to SpaceX, and it definitely isn't new to this industry. Most of our favorite rockets have gone through these tests, such as the Saturn V, the Space Shuttle, SLS, and even Falcon 9. By completing qualification testing before the vehicle flies, both major and minor design flaws are able to be uncovered and fixed, rather than finding out about them before or during your highly anticipated launch. Oftentimes, specialized testing rigs are used to qualify a vehicle on the ground. These use things like hydraulic rams to twist, bend, and compress various components of the rocket. In the case of the Saturn V, good old human core strength took the place of advanced machinery. In this classic footage, you can see several workers performing a team leg press exercise on the Saturn V while the crew above practices for an upcoming tug of war tournament. While this test in particular may seem a bit silly at first, it was actually an important process for determining how the vehicle would perform under high wind loading that it may experience during moderate or severe weather events. In order to find out the limit of a design, most companies will often conduct some sort of test of failure. This involves stressing the vehicle to extreme levels and increasing that stress until something eventually breaks. You will often see pressure tests occur alongside the structural testing or separately. A pressure test typically involves using an incompressible liquid or inert gases to bring the propellant tank up to or beyond flight pressure. In many cases, this can be done using nitrogen, which will not ignite in the event of a failure. A prime example of this is when NASA engineers tested an SLS core stage to failure at the Marshall Space Flight Center in late 2019. Using the massive semi-enclosed testing structure that they constructed specifically for this purpose, they pressurized the tank with gaseous nitrogen and exerted loads that matched what the tank would experience during launch and flight. According to a press release from NASA, throughout the tests in Marshall's 215-foot-tall test stand, they used large hydraulic pistons to deliver millions of pounds of punishing compression, tension, and bending forces on the robust test tank. And NASA's engineering standards really showed during this test as it was able to withstand 260% of the expected flight loads over five hours of testing before bursting violently. As we all know by now, Artemis 1 successfully launched at the end of 2022 with what seemed to be little to no issues with the SLS vehicle itself. Another excellent example of this type of testing is when SpaceX qualified Falcon 9's first stage back in 2009. Similar to how NASA tests their vehicles, SpaceX uses a specially built testing structure to stress test a Falcon 9. This stand is located at the McGregor, Texas testing facility near the iconic 130-foot-tall vertical tripod stand, where SpaceX routinely tests their Raptor 2 engines. So during these tests, a Falcon 9 test article would be placed inside of the structure, and according to a press release from SpaceX, the first stage tank and inner stage hardware were subjected to a proof test of 1.1 times the maximum expected operating pressure, and a burst proof test of 1.4 times the maximum expected operating pressure. That burst proof test, reaching 1.4 times the maximum expected operating pressure, is very important, as NASA requires a safety factor of 1.4 or greater for all crewed spacecraft. Basically, this means that the tanks must be able to withstand 140% of their expected nominal operating pressure during flight. In the same press release, SpaceX stated that the testing regimen included over 150 pressurization cycles, exceeding the number of required life cycles by more than 100. In addition, the first stage and inner stage were subjected to stiffness tests, maximum dynamic pressure loading, and main engine cutoff conditions. 
Looking at the test stand for Falcon 9, we can see this gray cap with hydraulic pistons mounted on the sides of it. These pistons would be able to pull the cap downwards, compressing the tanks and putting it through the same stiffness test that the press release mentioned. And when Falcon 9 had its inaugural launch, Four, guess what? Three, it went off nearly three, flawless, other than this little random rotation that it did. Of course, this isn't the Block 5 Falcon 9 that we all know today, but Falcon 9 version 1.0 was still key in bringing SpaceX to where it is today, allowing them to reach for even more ambitious goals like they are with the Starship program. Which reminds me, it's actually what we're supposed to be talking about here today, isn't it? Where is Jack? Oh, what the? I warned you. Oh, hey Zach, a little bit late, sorry about that. Oh, hey Jax. Thanks for joining us. Those of you who have ever watched the Starbase weekly live streams hosted by RGV Aerial Photography every Saturday at noon have probably already met Jax. Therefore, you know, he has a tendency to be fashionably late. While Jax is one of the many special agents on the CSI team, he is also a member of the Ring Watchers. If you follow the Ring Watchers on Twitter, then you likely already know that they are pretty much the unofficial third-party Starship manufacturing and logistics managers of the Starbase production site. Well, I suppose that's one way to put it. Not a lot happens here that they aren't aware of. So for that reason, we decided to upload Jax into a section of the Starbase artificial intelligence network that SpaceX allowed us to partition off for our own usage. Now that we have the introductions out of the way, we're gonna start this epic journey through Starship history at the only place where it makes sense, with Starhopper. So Jax, what can you tell us about the testing procedure for Starhopper and how that set the stage for the rest of the program? Well, Starhopper was the first vehicle to ever fly with a Methalox full flow stage combustion cycle engine. But other than being a 9 meter wide stainless steel tank, it doesn't have all too much in common with the things that came after it. Now Starhopper did do a couple of successful hop tests, proving that launching and landing a vehicle with Raptor was definitely possible. And yeah, now it's just a water tank at the launch site, sitting at the front, spying on everybody driving by. It's been around for over 1400 days now. To be completely honest, I don't know all that much about Starhopper. It happened long before I started watching this program, and it was built back in a time where there weren't tons of photographers swarming the production site. Hmm, not off to a very good start here, Jax. All right, well, how about we begin right after Elon Musk's Starship presentation at the end of 2019. This is where Elon unveiled the Mark 1 prototype for the first time. This is actually the first test article that really resembled the Starship that we know today. At this point in time, the plan was to fly Starship Mark 1 on a 20 kilometer suborbital flight test and Mark 3 on the first orbital flight test. Mark 1 moved out to the launch site on October 31st, 2019 for its initial round of testing. Now it doesn't take much to see that Mark 1 looked pretty rough. Mark 1 didn't use the traditional 6 foot tall rings that most people have come to know and love today. Rather, it used various panels welded together to create the 9 meter wide tank. And because there are a lot more welds, you increase the chance of introducing additional weak points, especially in areas where you have welds meeting together. Now, a skilled welder in optimal conditions can create a weld that's even stronger than the parent material itself. However, in poor, dirty conditions with less experienced welders, which was Starbase in 2019, there may be added internal stresses, very small cracks, and a variety of other issues. And this really showed when Mark 1 underwent a cryogenic pressure test on November 20th of that year which involved loading the tanks with liquid nitrogen and bringing them up to flight pressure. During this test, Mark 1's top and bottom domes blew out, destroying the vehicle. Despite the failure, Mark 1 taught a lot of valuable lessons about how not to build a rocket. In order to make sure this program was still viable, SpaceX had to keep moving. And this is when the program took a sudden turn. With Mark 1's design flaws, nearly everything had to be reevaluated. Because of this, the Starship site at Sidco Road in Florida halted production on their Starship Mark II prototype. This signifies the conclusion of the Mark prototypes, giving SpaceX time to start producing smaller test tanks. Essentially, a test tank is two domes creating a single enclosed tank. They can test different construction techniques, designs, or really anything. Moving forwards, we would end up seeing a lot of these. We will often refer to the lower dome as the aft dome, and the upper one as the forward dome. The first of these test tanks, test tank number one, introduced many new designs that we've come to know and love today, such as using nine meter wide rings rather than welded panels. 
Another big change with test tank number one was the implementation of new dome designs. In a tweet asking what had changed between these domes and Mark 1s, Elon Musk stated that the new domes used stamped panels rather than manually bump formed panels. They had also moved away from flux core welding, now using tip TIG welding. But SpaceX hadn't quite decided on a dome design yet. If we look at the domes, we can see that the middle portion of the dome is made out of two rows of panels. One dome had the welds meet at a plus shape, whereas the other had them staggered, not unlike how you'll often see bricks on a house. But why is this relevant? Well, this is an excellent example of SpaceX's iteration process, and how they can rapidly test new designs. It was tested with water later that month, and ended up bursting. According to Elon Musk, Test Tank 1's dome weld failed at 7.1 bar which is roughly 7.1 times the pressure of Earth's atmosphere at sea level. This didn't quite reach the 8.5 bar that SpaceX had intended to reach, which would have satisfied NASA's human spaceflight safety requirement of a 1.4 safety factor, which essentially means that the tank must be able to withstand 140% of its maximum expected operating pressure if it's meant to fly NASA astronauts. Anyways, SpaceX got to work right away on fixing these issues, but in the meantime, they brought out a new, smaller test tank. If you've watched any of the five Starship high altitude flight tests, well, I guess we really only saw four, you might be familiar with the liquid oxygen header tank at the very tip of Starship's nose cone, used for the flip and burn landing maneuver. SpaceX built a test tank for the LOX header and brought it out to the pad in order to verify that this design would be ready to use. After conducting a successful cryogenic proofing with liquid nitrogen, SpaceX wanted to find the limit of this design. So on January 25th, 2020, a test of failure occurred, bursting the nose cone and the header tank open. Elon would later confirm that this was a successful test, so nothing super notable happened here. Wait, so did they ever perform any kind of test of failure using negative pressure? Well, why would they need to do that? I mean, I imagine that the autogenous pressurization system for a tank that small has to be pretty precise. If it underperforms and is not delivering enough gas to make up for the liquid being drained from it, that could cause the header tank to implode. If they have an upper bound for max pressure that the tank can withstand before bursting, I would think they would also want to know what the lower boundary is as well. Yeah, I suppose that's a good point. But as far as I know, we haven't seen any proof that such a test was performed. But we also can't say that it wasn't necessarily. Anyways, after Starship Test Tank 1 failed, we mentioned that SpaceX got to work on building their next test tank. And Test Tank 2 came along. Visually this looked pretty much the same as Number 1, but featured some design upgrades in response to the issues that Number 1 had. Most notably, SpaceX began to use the same construction method for both the forward and aft domes. The design of these domes had also changed once again. Instead of having two layers of panels in the middle section of the dome, which we discussed earlier, it's now a single layer of much larger panels. It's not identical to what's used today, but it is a lot more similar. Other smaller changes were made, such as this weld doubler plate continuing all the way down the bottom ring's vertical weld, rather than halfway like on Test Tank 1. Weld doubler plates are used to increase the thickness of an area to strengthen the potential weak point. On Starship, you'll typically see these over weld lines in areas where other reinforcements can't be placed. Now complete, Test Tank 2 rolled out to the launch site for testing. It went through a pressure test using gaseous nitrogen, and sprung a small leak on one of the weld doublers. Luckily this was minor enough to repair, so a day later, they retested it with liquid nitrogen, intentionally popping it at 8.5 bar, which satisfied the NASA human safety requirement that they were trying to meet. This success gave SpaceX the confidence to move back to doing full-scale vehicles, the first since Mark 1's fantastic failure. SpaceX's return to full-scale vehicles started a new naming system. Starship Serial No. 1, or SN1, was the only the tank section of a ship, meaning it had no payload bay or nose cone. After being built, it rolled out to suborbital pad A on February 25, 2020. SpaceX planned a simple and easy cryogenic proofing to verify that SN1 could hold pressure, hopefully better than Mark 1 could. While the day came on February 28th, so SpaceX began filling serial number one with liquid nitrogen, and it was looking like a great test, until it wasn't. Serial number one's aft section wasn't able to take the pressure. 
and once it failed, it caused a very rapid pressure change, imploding the tank. This wasn't great. So just like when Mark 1 failed, SpaceX's plans had to very rapidly change. So Elon Musk went to Twitter and announced that serial number 2 would be a stripped-down test tank to verify an updated thrust structure. It rolled out to the launch site with the goal of testing out the thrust structure that would be present on serial numbers 3, 4, 5, and 6, including the new thrust puck underneath of them. Hold on, Jax. I think we should explain what a thrust puck is because this is something that's going to come up repeatedly as we go through this. Good point. Well, a thrust puck is a large plate located on the center of both the ship and the booster's aft dome, which has the engine mounts for the central cluster of gimbling engines. The ship has a thrust puck with three mounts for the center three Raptor engines. This has gone through many design revisions, but we'll go more in depth about these changes later on in today's investigation. The booster has a thrust puck with 13 engine mounts, however it previously had 9. Respectively this would have supported a 33 engine booster and a 29 engine booster. Now the outer 20 Raptor boost engines don't attach to this, rather they attach to mounts directly on the ring section itself. So SpaceX needed to figure out a way to test out the thrust structure. This is where SpaceX's thrust rams come into play. I'll hand it over to Zach for that though. Well. The word thrust ram is basically just a fancy way of saying hydraulic piston. Hydraulic pistons like the one you are seeing here are used in nearly every structural verification test performed at Starbase. Some of them are used to pull down on a structure and others are used to push upwards. When they push upwards, we refer to them as a thrust ram. You will also hear this referred to as a puck shucker. The reason for this is because their job is to simulate the thrust of a Raptor engine on the thrust puck. In order to do this, the hydraulic cylinder must be anchored to the ground or the test structure on one end, and then on the other end, the head of the piston is attached to the mounting bracket for the Raptor engines. Special adapters are added onto the end of the piston in order to allow it to bolt directly to the engine mount. These adapters are near identical to the ones you will find on the top of a Raptor engine. This allows them to easily be attached to the thrust dome in the exact location they are needed. Basically, the goal of this test is to verify that the thrust puck will not fail when these forces are applied during normal operating conditions. With that explanation out of the way, Jax, how did that test end up working out for SN2? In the case of serial number two, there was only a single thrust ram used during its cryogenic pressure test on March 8th of 2020. This time, there was nothing really exciting to report about once it was over. This made it the first test article since Starhopper to successfully survive testing. After this was complete, it rolled back to the production site, and it was eventually moved to the Sanchez site where it remains to this day. SN2 now functions as a water storage tank, watching over the rocket garden. But with this success, surely nothing could go wrong from here. This success with serial number 2 was great news, and SpaceX was confident again. During a Falcon 9 Starlink launch livestream that occurred shortly after this testing concluded, commentator Jesse Anderson made this statement. Next up are a series of static fire and short flight tests with our serial number three test article and longer flights with our serial number four. We'll see how this holds up. They had a long way to go before this happened. Unlike serial number two, serial number three was outfitted with plumbing and various other pieces that may change the structural integrity of the vehicle. In this model of serial number three's thrust puck from 3D forensics agent Chameleon Circuit, we can see that the methane downcomer pipe which connects to the upper methane tank, splits off three ways, and then passes through holes that go directly through the dome itself. This may not seem like a big deal, and it probably wasn't at the time, but these holes do create a potential issue as you now need to have extra doubler plates to strengthen the area around them, increasing the material on your vehicle and the amount of time to produce that section. But anyways, serial number three rolled over to suborbital pad A and was placed over top of the stand's ramps. A cryo test with the thrust rams active occurred on April 3rd, but this test didn't exactly go to plan. An unfortunate testing configuration error led to the liquid methane tank being filled up over a depressurized oxygen tank. This caused the vehicle to collapse in on itself. But this wasn't an issue with the vehicle itself, it was a configuration mistake. So as much as there was reason for disappointment, this wasn't like Mark 1 or serial number 1. These tests we just talked about were all lessons about how to make Starship hold pressure. But now, it was time to get into the next phase of testing. So, as Elon mentioned, 
SN3 failed due to a testing configuration error, so SN4 was able to proceed with a similar design. Although because SpaceX was rightfully nervous after their cryo-testing failures earlier that year, SN4 was only pushed a 4.9 bar during its first cryogenic proofing, which involved using the thrust ramps. This meant that it was time to enter a new phase of testing, the static firing campaign. So a Raptor engine was finally installed, and it conducted two static fire tests, one on May 5th, 2020, and then another on May 7th. SN4 would then conduct another cryogenic pressure test, reaching 7.9 bar this time. Three more static fires followed with one on May 19th, one on May 28th, and a final static fire on May 29th. After the fifth static fire, a quick disconnect issue on the suborbital test stand caused methane and oxygen to begin spewing everywhere. This highly dangerous environment didn't take long to find an ignition source, and a massive detonation followed. This destroyed both Pad A and SN4. But luckily SpaceX would never have to deal with a methane and oxygen rich environment under their vehicle ever again. It was now time to move on to bigger and better things, so design changes needed to be tested. This is serial number 7, and this tank is about as simple as it got, visually sharing a lot with the original test tanks after Mark 1. SN7 was testing out new manufacturing techniques in addition to moving towards 304L stainless steel rather than 301. 304L is a more durable grade of stainless steel, with a higher chromium content compared to 301. And during an attempted test of failure on June 15th, 2020, SN7 sprung a leak. However, SpaceX crews were able to patch the leak, allowing testing to continue. And so they continued. During a spectacular test on June 23rd, SN7 blew out its bottom dome, which tore in multiple weld locations. However, this was confirmed to be the intended outcome by Elon on Twitter. He stated that SN7 had a few known flaws, and a second test tank would follow it to address these issues. So, as I said, the next step for SpaceX was to construct another test tank to address the flaws found in SN7. But before they got to that new test tank, it was time for SN5 to make its debut. After completing a cryogenic proofing with the thrust rams underneath and a static fire test, SN5 became the first Starship tank section to take flight, flying to an altitude of 150 meters and successfully landing. Serial number 6 followed essentially the same testing campaign as 5, finishing off with a 150 meter hop. Now it was time for the second test tank that Elon had mentioned. SN7.1 had a few changes, and one of the most notable was the brand new thrust puck underneath of it. We can recall that the previous design had the liquid methane pipes for the Raptor engines run through holes in the dome. But pulling up the new design, we can see that these pipes now go through their own holes on the edge of the puck itself, which meant that SpaceX no longer had to worry about those extra three weak points in the dome, and the added complexity that came with them. Ah, okay. So then it makes sense that they would test this design on the thrust rams to verify it, so they know it's good to go before incorporating it into SN8. And all the vehicles that came after it. Well about that. Serial number 8 was actually pretty well into production by this point. You can see its aft section right here around this time period. So if an issue came up, it would have been more than just SN7.1 that was affected. Huh. Isn't that a risky move? Well, it definitely can be if something goes wrong. SpaceX was starting to speed up production of their ships, and this is something that we'll see a lot more moving forward. Anyways, serial number 7.1 once again used 304L stainless steel, addressing some of the issues with SN7. One of its most unique features was an additional skirt section, which typically houses the Raptor engines and landing legs. This new leg skirt allowed it to be mounted on the brand new suborbital pad B for some of its testing. It first rolled out to the pad in September 2020 and conducted a proof test on the ground. It was then the first thing to be placed on pad B, which at the time was outfitted with thrust rams. A cryogenic proofing followed utilizing these rams, testing out the new thrust puck. After presumably passing, it was then removed from the pad and then placed back onto a test tank stand, allowing SpaceX to conduct a few more pressure tests, with the fifth and final resulting in a spectacular tank rupture. You can see that the straps, which had been wrapped over the top of the tank, did a great job of keeping any debris from flying away, as the forward dome had nearly been blown clean off. Elon Musk would confirm on Twitter that serial number 7.1 passed testing fine enough, 
Although after the test we saw SpaceX marked out multiple welds and the tank hatch, later cutting them out. Presumably this would have been for further investigation into those parts, possibly involving testing to find the integrity of those areas post cryogenic testing. Anyways, now it was time for the big flight. Starship serial number 8 set many milestones, as it was the first flight worthy full scale ship. SN8 went through some structural testing as well, as the thrust rams were present during its cryogenic proofing. It would then conduct multiple three engine tests, with it all leading to the 12.5 kilometer test flight. SN8 performed pretty much flawlessly during the ascent phase, and the sound of those three Raptor engines on liftoff was just amazing. After it reached the apogee point and began its belly flop maneuver, Elon let us know that the switchover from main fuel tanks to the header tanks was successful. Wow, I remember this like it was yesterday. As soon as that flip maneuver began, I really thought they were about to pull this off on their first attempt. Well, as we all know, that wasn't the case, and the flight actually ended in a pretty spectacular explosion. This test arguably went better than anybody was expecting it to, however, and overall SN8's performance was definitely a cause for celebration. After reviewing the data, Elon tweeted out the source of the failed landing attempt citing low pressure in the methane header tank as the reason the engines weren't able to generate the amount of thrust needed to bring the vehicle to a halt. Hmm, that sounds like a fancy way of saying the header tank imploded. Maybe this is that negative pressure test that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, I guess that's one way to put it. Anyways, SpaceX was on a roll now, and Starship serial number 9 was prepared to follow up behind SN8 pretty quickly. However, there were some complications before it moved to the pad. On December 11th, 2020, SN9 conducted a structural test on one of its forward flaps in the high bay, when it tipped over. This led to a very careful rescue mission using the LR1600-2 crane that SpaceX had rented, lifting SN9 vertical and placing it on a new stand. Yeah, that was back in the day before they installed that gigantic bridge crane. I wish I could have been here to watch that rescue operation. <laughs> yeah. Now SpaceX is known for being incredibly good at fixing things that are broken. But where on earth were they going to find a new flap on such short notice? One look at SN10's nose cone and it became pretty clear that he was going to have to make a sacrifice for the greater good. Once the new flap was installed, SN9 was transferred out to the pad for testing. While it did conduct a cryogenic proofing, it didn't use the thrust ramps on suborbital pad B. The thrust puck had already been verified on SN8, and since the design hadn't changed, there was no need to test it again. In this photo from Steve Jurvetson, just a day before SN9 tipped over, we can see that it already had two Raptor engines installed. Once all three were installed, SN9 conducted six static fires ahead of its flight. But before it flew, SN10 joined it at the pad, which was the very first time two ships were present at the launch site. When the launch day came around, SN9 soared to 10 kilometers, did a flip, and then during the landing attempt, a failure to relight one of the Raptor engines caused quite the impact. You know, I've always thought it was a miracle that SN10 managed to survive that event without sustaining any damage. But I guess the fact that SpaceX had both vehicles on the pad at the same time was really a sign that they had a lot of confidence that they were actually going to land this on their second attempt. Well, I suppose you can't really blame them. After the success with SN8, I think most of us expected that the next attempt was going to go pretty near perfectly. But moving past SN9, SpaceX's next test tank was really future oriented as this was the first test tank to be made out of 3mm thick steel, as opposed to the 4mm steel that Starship had used up to this point. It had a thrust puck like what we saw tested on SN7.1, but this seemed to be more about testing the 3mm style of dome rather than thrust testing. It started off with a cryo test on January 26, 2021, which Elon Musk confirmed was successful. During the second test, it sprung a leak on the weld line, which caused this very large shot of vapors out the side. After this, serial number 7.2 was retired and eventually scrapped. Wait, did they end up making another 3mm tank so they could try again? Nope. So they're still using 4mm stainless steel now? Well, we don't often see labels, but it seems like they're still using 4mm steel. 
The thinner gauge seal hasn't been implemented on Starship yet anywhere other than the payload section to our knowledge, and even that's 3.6 millimeters last we saw. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we're going to discuss that a bit more in part 2 of this investigation. SN10 would follow SN7.2, conducting its own 10km test flight. 10 was super close, and it very nearly pulled it off, but it managed to crash softly on the landing pad. Bruh, that was not a soft landing. You can literally see it bounce back up after slamming down onto the landing pad. In that other angle from SpaceX, you can see that the landing legs were clearly crushed in the process. Well, yeah. Anyways, this caused much of the plumbing in the aft section to be damaged in addition to ongoing fires, all of which led to the very first second flight of a full-scale Starship. But SN10 did land, and that was good progress. At this point in time, hopes were high Four, for a successful three, landing with the brand new SN11. One. SN11 didn't land. I still don't get it, Jax. Why would they do this in the fog? Yo, have you got any information about that? Uh, no. Damn! Even though SpaceX still had not successfully landed a Starship yet at this point, they seemed confident that they eventually would with the next few attempts. With that mindset, it was time to start preparing for the next phase in the Starship program, orbital flight testing. So SpaceX constructed a testing structure to figure out exactly how Starship would fare during Max-Q. But I'll hand it over to Zach for this one. Okay, so assembly of the custom-made dynamic testing structure for nose cones began in the middle of January 2021, shortly after SN8's crash landing. This is when the six sections that make up the base of the test stand started to arrive at the production site. SpaceX engineers wasted no time assembling this once the parts were on site. Once assembled, extensions for the six legs were added to give it additional stability to prevent whatever is on top of it from tipping over. For some reason that I still can't figure out, these six legs were removed. I believe this may be a sign that this structure was originally intended to test much taller sections of the vehicle than what we have actually seen it used for up to this point. Every structural test stand constructed at Starbase is designed in a way that it can be reconfigured for multiple purposes. There is a lot of foresight that goes into the design of these structures, which is why I like to explain how they actually work. Hopefully you will gain an appreciation for that as we go. I'm going to interrupt here, because speaking of foresight, about a week before this new testing structure started to show up at the production site, SpaceX had already begun modifying Starship Serial Number 12's nose cone for testing. At this point in the testing, they were probably already certain that SN12 through 14, which were all pretty much the same design as 8 through 11, would simply not work due to an inherent issue in that generation of vehicles, likely stemming from the unreliable Raptor 1 engine. For this reason, SN12, which was initially planned to become a full Starship, was turned into a test article. Unfortunately, cancel culture is deeply embedded here at Starbase. Although this generation of Starship was being retired, the nose cones construction method on SN15 and Ship 20 was basically the same as SN8 through 12, which made it a suitable candidate for qualifying the non-pressurized, empty payload section of the Starship. Alright, while well, continuing where we left off, once the six sections for the base of the test stand were fully assembled, SpaceX workers began installing the lower half of the cage structure that would be used to support all of the testing hardware. Off to the right, you can see two adapters which are used to simulate the forward flaps once they are attached to the mounting locations on either side of the nose cone. At the time this photo was taken, SN12's nose cone had just been stacked on top of its forward dome section. You can see two of the mounting brackets for the forward flaps on this side. What we wouldn't see until after this test article was scrapped was that on top of the forward dome, an additional cone with a flat tip was attached to the top. This allowed for a hydraulic piston to be mounted on top of the forward dome. This piston is used to pull down on the tip of the nose cone. The only other structural alteration done to this test article that made it any different from SN15, which it was intended to emulate, was the removal of the tip. You can also see that a small disc was welded on top of the open hole to create a flat mounting surface. A cap was later welded to the top of this disc. There was an anchor mounted to the top of the cap on the inside of the cone which allowed a large rope to be attached between the tip of the nose cone and the hydraulic piston down below. Pulling down on the nose cone like this is the method SpaceX chose to simulate the forces exerted on the vehicle during the Max-Q phase. 
After the rest of the cage was assembled, the nose cone jail with SN12 locked up inside of it was moved to the launch site for testing. There were a few very important items still missing from this test structure that were not added until it arrived to the pad. Luckily, Starship Gazer was able to get close-up footage from several different angles so we could better understand how it was intended to be used. Starting from the top, we can see a small cylindrical tank located on the upper support structure. This is known as a hydraulic accumulator. Accumulators are used to store potential energy, similar to a battery, except in the form of pressurized fluid. This is likely a bladder type accumulator, which stores nitrogen gas inside of a soft bladder that will expand once filled with gas. The bladder is filled until it presses down on a poppet valve at the bottom of the shell. Once hydraulic fluid is pumped into the accumulator, it causes pressure inside of the bladder to increase, which allows it to function as a spring. The bladder stores the potential energy needed to push the hydraulic fluid out. From here, the fluid is used to actuate a hydraulic piston elsewhere. Looking from the aerial view, you can see that there are two hydraulic pistons attached to the nose cap. With pistons in these two locations, SpaceX is able to pull or push the nose cone in virtually any direction. By doing this, they can simulate the forces that would be experienced by the nose cone during the re-entry phase. These forces will likely cause the entire vehicle to flex and bend. I do not believe these pistons would ever be active at the same time as the one on the inside that's pulling down on the vehicle. These should be two separate tests, one for max Q and the other for re-entry. When performing re-entry tests, it's important to also account for the forces being exerted on the hinges of the forward flaps of the Starship. There should be some method of pulling the flaps in the leeward direction. Looking at the forward flap adapter, we can see a double clevis bracket which is directly in line with another single clevis on the black support frame. It was difficult to see from behind the frame, but looking ahead to a future test that we will discuss later, we know that the piston should look something like this. It has a blue load cell on the end, which would also allow SpaceX engineers to monitor the amount of force being applied by the hydraulic piston. In particular, this would be of use if the nose cone were to buckle or collapse during the test. This would tell them exactly how much pressure it was able to withstand before failing. The only visual verification that we have that this piston was actually present is this shot taken by RGV Aerial Photography, which shows the two struts and two pistons laying on the ground next to the suborbital test stand A. Without this image, we would never know for sure if structural integrity of the forward flaps during re-entry was part of their qualification testing or not. So in summary, we know that this test involves pulling down on the tip of the nose cone, pulling the nose cone in different directions to simulate the bending of the airframe, and also a dynamic loading test of the flaps. Now let's watch this footage from NASA spaceflight of the actual test. Looking at the footage from a first glance, it may appear that nothing really happened during this testing event. However, if we pay attention to a few locations where we know the hydraulic lines are located, we can actually see the hoses flexing as the hydraulic actuators are extending or retracting various pistons. So when we see this occur, we know that this is the place to look for signs of something happening. Notice that at the times where the hoses are moving, you can also see the cross braces on the right and left sides flexing while the ship is being pulled in various directions. And last but not least, when we look at the top of the nose cone, we can actually see the entire thing shift from side to side as the pistons are pushing out, causing the structure to bend in that direction. Unfortunately, we were unable to determine when the max Q portion of this testing was occurring because it was very difficult to see the nose cone actually being pulled downwards. So given that this was not a test of failure, how would SpaceX know that the test article performed as expected? Well, for this, SpaceX attached several measurement devices to the side of the structure. These are known as strain gauges, and you will almost always see them spread out in various locations on every test article that SpaceX creates. A strain gauge is a device that is used to measure strain or deformation in a material. It typically consists of a thin strip of metal, such as aluminum or nickel, that is bonded to a substrate. As the material to which the gauge is attached is deformed, the resistance of the gauge changes. This change in resistance can be measured and used to calculate the amount of strain in the material. Strain gauges are often used in engineering and testing applications to measure the stress on structures such as bridges, aircraft, and machinery. So using this, SpaceX will likely be able to determine whether or not the deformation in the outer walls of the nose cone was within the expected or acceptable tolerances. After this test was completed, we didn't see any tweets from Elon about the results. I assume that means everything went well because we also haven't seen any other nose cone structural tests since SN12. 
Although in part two of this deep dive investigation, you will see that this was not necessarily a good thing. So after this, it was time for SpaceX to move on to Starship serial number 15. SN15 was a new generation of Starship, with a plethora of changes. But with the topic of this video in mind, we'll talk about how SN15's brand new thrust puck changed. Most ships before SN8 used this design, with the methane pipes running through holes in the dome. SN8 through 14 used this design, with the methane pipes running through holes in the thrust puck itself. SN15 introduced this design, with the methane pipes now running directly through the center of the puck, entering a manifold that was built into it. This design is actually still used to this day, barring a few modifications here and there. Suborbital pad A was prepared with the thrust rams, and SN15 rolled out to the pad, conducting a couple of cryogenic proofing tests. Wait, hold on a sec, am I missing something here? Where was the test tank for this one? Great question. There wasn't one. At this point in time, they seemed to start wanting to produce ships faster and faster. So, designs started to be tested directly on the ships themselves. This design was theoretically stronger, as holes had been removed from it, but either way, we're going to see this testing method a lot more in the future. SN15 performed two static fires, one on April 26th, and again the next day on the 27th, both of which seemed to go off without a hitch. On May 5th, 2021, SN15 became the fifth starship to perform a high-altitude flight test. After it reached its 10 km apogee, it performed a belly flop maneuver and descended into the clouds. When it re-emerged, Cosmic Perspective caught one of the most incredible moments in spaceflight history. It took a lot of hard work to reach this point. SpaceX built upon every success and failure during structural qualification testing that they experienced with every vehicle and test article, going all the way back to Mark 1. The lessons they learned resulted in a near perfect landing of serial number 15. After it landed, its landing legs were removed, and it was lifted on top of test stand B so its engines could also be removed, and it was then transported to the rocket garden. SN15 remains one of the only vehicles that we expect to have permanent tenure in the garden, as it represents a major milestone in the Starship development history. Due to SN15's success and the push towards orbit, SpaceX decided that SN16, 17, 18, and 19 would be skipped in favor of Ship 20. This meant that SN15 was the last suborbital flight test and would be the last flight in Starbase in 2021, followed by no flights in all of 2022. But a lot of development happened in this downtime, starting off with the very first Super Heavy Booster test tank. Booster 2, or BN2, was a test tank designed to test out the brand new thrust section that would be present on future boosters. Hey Jax, isn't that BN 2.1? Well, oh that's quite the story. But I'll give the short version. A decent amount of folks at home may know this as test tank BN 2.1, however in retrospect, we know that all of the labeled parts for this listed it as BN2. Notice how this label also has a test tank diagram, which is pretty helpful and fairly rare. We also know that the next test tank was numbered 2.1. We'll touch on that later, but as far as we're concerned, this was in fact BN2. Anyways, looking at the aft dome, it kind of looks weird. If we look really closely at it and pull out our notes to compare some weld markings, we can see that there's a hole in the middle. Knowing that BN2 would eventually conduct cryotesting, it seems like a fair bet to assume that it didn't have a 2.5 meter wide hole in the bottom. So, this design would require the middle to be welded on afterwards, completing the complement of 29 engine mounts. Booster 1 used a similar design to this, even though it never got to leave the high bay intact. But Booster 3 and onwards had a design that was one solid puck, with all of the center engine mounts. With this difference in mind, it seems like rather than testing the thrust puck itself, this might have been more so testing the concept of a booster thrust dome, which has a much larger hole in it to support a much larger thrust puck. But how did SpaceX test this? They'd only ever tested three engine mounts before. Over to you, Zach. After SN12 finished up with testing inside of the nose cone jail, 
SpaceX technicians removed the cage and then chopped the nose cone in half and scrapped it. The white circular platform for the base was also removed, and in place of the cage, an additional removable frame was added on top of the base structure. This frame allowed the BN2 test tank to be placed on top and welded down to the steel base. NASA spaceflight captured this footage of it the day it was lifted onto the test stand. From this angle, we can see that there were nine thrust rams arranged in the middle of the structure. Using this render from SpaceX 3D Eccentric, we can get a better idea of how these are laid out. This test stand allowed SpaceX to test the thrust puck for the nine center engines mounted on BN2. By June 15th, BN2 and the structural test stand had been moved to the launch site, and then SpaceX engineers ran a temporary line all the way over to the suborbital pad A to allow them to fill the test tank with liquid nitrogen and conduct the structural integrity test on BN2's nine engine thrust puck. BN2 performed a cryo test on June 8th, 2021, followed by another one on the 17th. Jax, what do we know about the results? Well, we didn't hear anything official. But SpaceX happily moved on from BN2, so it seems like it passed testing well enough as far as we know. Once it rolled back to the Sanchez site, it was placed on a newly constructed concrete base, where it now serves as a water tank. Both SN2 and BN2 as water tanks. Isn't that something? After this test was completed, SpaceX began preparing for the first and only static fire test of Booster 3 by removing the new adapter from the nose cone jail base and placing it on top of test stand A. Now testing is about to get real. Super Heavy is out at the pad, and SpaceX has a load of new tests to complete ahead of their first orbital flight test, which at this point in time was said to be with Booster 4 and Ship 20 in the summer of 2021. Booster 3 was the first ever Super Heavy booster to roll out to the pad, later getting mounted to test stand A. There was a lot of weird stuff with how this booster was set up, which was briefly discussed in the recent CSI Starbase investigation that discussed engine chill and flame arresters on the orbital launch mount. We'll skip over all of those fun details for today, but I recommend checking out that episode if you haven't already. Anyways, the important thing to note is that Booster 3 only conducted two tests, a cryogenic proof test, followed by a three-engine static fire on July 19th, 2021. The reason it only needed these two tests is because the structural qualification tests performed on BN2 gave SpaceX the confidence to skip over the puck shocker testing and go straight for static fire right after cryo testing. And then it was brutally and publicly executed by the Buckner-owned Liebherr LR-11000 crane on August 14th of 2021. Around this time, a new test article named B2.1 was making an appearance. And this one has big implications. But B2.1 was actually a few parts at this point in time. There was the B2.1 booster forward dome, the B2.1 ship leg skirt, the B2.1 ship aft dome, and the B2.1 booster aft dome sleeve. So yeah, B2.1 was actually a little bit of a ship and a little bit of a booster, which the name doesn't necessarily imply. At the end of June, over at the production site, SpaceX used the B2.1 booster forward dome and the B2.1 ship leg skirt to test out the three locking clamps that connect the ship and booster together. We can actually see the hydraulic piston that actuated these clamps through the grid fin hole right here. This has been very helpful in figuring out how these clamps actually operate. After this, the leg skirt used for this test had another ring added on top and disappeared into the tents. It would later go to the Sanchez site after it had been developed to replicate the structure of the skirt on ships 20, 21, 22, and 23. It seems fairly likely that the plan was to test the integrity of this skirt, but it disappeared in early October of 2021, and it's now presumed dead. Anyways, stepping forward about a month, the B2.1 aft dome was sleeved with a... a booster aft dome sleeve? Yeah, this is what we called the hybrid section. Three center engine mounts, three vacuum engine mounts, and 20 outer engine mounts. And this is when B2.1 went silent for a while. So we'll briefly mention an important test that SpaceX did during this gap period. Ship 20. Oh, what you could have been. S20 was a new generation of ship, and it was the very first ship that was orbit capable. This also came with some significant changes to the structure, but one of the major ones was the addition of three vacuum raptor engines. Unlike the engines on the ship to date, these engines were not placed on a thrust puck in the center of the dome. Rather, they were mounted directly to the dome itself. This is when SpaceX introduced their brand new thrust rams for the RVAC engines. And these were used for Ship 20's cryogenic proofing at the end of September 2021. As Zach explained earlier, thrust rams are hydraulic pistons used to simulate the thrust of Raptor engines during cryo testing. 
To reach the higher up engines, SpaceX built new raised pedestals for these thrust ramps to sit on, increasing their height. Now there was no test tank or anything prior to this being tested, so SpaceX seemed confident that their new six engine design, with the additional holes for six liquid oxygen and methane pipes for each engine, would be safe for flight. And luckily this seems to have been the case, as Ship 20 would move on to conduct various static fire tests after this. Back over at the production site, V2.1 was finally starting to show up once again. It wasn't until October 2021 when SpaceX finally stacked the hybrid aft section and the booster forward dome, which we talked about earlier, in the mid-bay, creating yet another test tank. After it was welded and left the mid-bay, the booster forward dome underwent heavy modifications, with external stringers being added all around the top. If you remember B2.1 being tested, this is probably the most recognizable form it was in. They also added these grid fin simulators into the mounting holes, which essentially simulate the structure of grid fins being present without them actually needing to be there. And it was time to conduct some structural testing, the first using SpaceX's brand new testing rig, the Can Crusher. I'll let Zach explain how this worked. Construction of the booster version of the dynamic test stand, which is referred to as the Can Crusher, began just over a month after the suborbital test flight of SN15. On June 15th of 2021, SpaceX constructed a square concrete pad near what would later be known as the Rocket Garden. A week later, on June 21st, the first of 10 sections used to create the base of the gigantic test structure was spotted by Brady Keniston in this photo for NASA spaceflight. Also seen on the truck was one of the 10 catwalk sections. You can see it more closely here in this image from Starship Gazer. A few days later, they began assembling the structure on top of the concrete pad. Each of the 10 vertical sections were connected together using a pair of joining plates. All of these sections and the joining plates had to be welded together. This wasn't exactly a quick job because this thing is massive. You can get a better appreciation for the scale of it with a human standing nearby. After they finished welding the superstructure together, crews began laying out formwork in the center of the structure. Looking at this animation from SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric, we can see that on the inside bottom edge of the frame, there are a bunch of steel pins, also known as Nelson studs. They have been welded on so that they're facing the inside and they're used to anchor the concrete pad in the center to the superstructure. Once the concrete was placed, it not only drastically increased the weight of this structural test stand, making it more resistant to tipping over, but it also provided a flat surface for a variety of thrust simulator configurations that we will see later in this investigation. Returning to the exterior of the can crusher, there are massive holes bored into each of the 20 mounting tabs that were used to attach 20 hydraulic pistons to the outside of the structure. Notice that this time I did not refer to these as thrust rams. The reason for this is because these pistons would not be used to simulate the thrust of a Raptor engine by pushing up on the thrust puck, but instead they would be used to pull down on the exterior of the vehicle. In order to do this, SpaceX engineers designed a special circular cap to go on the top of the vehicle. Looking at it from the side, you can see that each of these four sections that make up this cap have five locations for a large rope to be guided through until there is an even length on both sides. Then the two ends are looped around an adapter that's on the tip of the hydraulic pistons down below. The outer 20 hydraulic pistons can be used individually for testing structural integrity under a static load. This type of configuration could be used to verify that the aft section of the booster is able to withstand the weight of a fully loaded methane tank and Starship on top of it. To simulate dynamic loading, or max-Q conditions, the pistons on the inside of the structure can be used to push up on the thrust puck, while the ones on the outside are simultaneously pulling down on the cap. Hopefully now you can see why we refer to this as the can crusher. This test structure is extremely versatile, and the pistons can be reconfigured in a multitude of ways in order to support a wide variety of structural verification tests that SpaceX may need to perform on new vehicle designs and construction methods. The key feature that enables this test stand to be used in so many different ways is its massive hydraulic distribution system, which allows it to support more than 50 hydraulic pistons at the same time. On top of the catwalk, you will notice that there are 10 pressure vessels, which you should now recognize as hydropneumatic accumulators. There is a control panel located next to each accumulator, and this is what's responsible for distributing the hydraulic fluid to the pistons. On the backside of each panel, there are between four and six ports to allow hoses to be connected for each of the individual pistons. There are at least 53 of these hydraulic lines from what I can count. This means that all 20 pistons on the outer edge can be used to pull down on the test tank, 
while an additional 33 thrust rams on the inside can be pushing upwards all at the same time. We have not actually seen that occur yet from my understanding, but at least they have the option to do so should they want to. The reason I am going as in depth with this description as I am is because I truly believe that this is an amazing test structure. The alternative to this is building an 80 meter tall high bay for the sole purpose of performing these tests. For B2.1's testing, the can crusher was outfitted with six central thrust rams pressing up on the ship aft dome. Interestingly, this photo from Maria Pointer shows that the central three thrust rams were at a pretty significant angle during the thrust ramming. So why would SpaceX do this? Well, when Starship goes to conduct its landing flip and burn maneuver, the center Raptor engines will ignite and throttle up, while being at a similar gimbaled angle. Remember that the Raptor engine can gimbal up to 15 degrees in each direction, so SpaceX probably wanted to verify that the new 6 engine thrust dome would be able to take these lateral forces if it ended up making it to that portion of the flight. At the launch site, B2.1 conducted three cryogenic pressure tests, both of which likely involved the thrust rams underneath. You will however notice that the can crusher's cap was not installed, so they had not begun the compressive structural testing that the crusher gets its name from. Once B2.1 was done with these cryo tests, it moved back to the Sanchez site and crews started getting to work on it, preparing it for crush testing. But this is when some weird stuff started happening. SpaceX employees started adding this square tube reinforcement around the unpressurized area of the tank's aft section. Essentially, it's mini skirt. Why do this? This doesn't match what was present on booster 4 and 5, so it seems like SpaceX knew that something wasn't okay with this test tank. The main point of interest for this test seemed to be the booster aft sleeve, so basically the bottom half. This needed to be structurally verified before Booster 4 and Ship 20 made their orbital flight, so SpaceX tested B2.1 overnight on the 18th of December 2021. And this was the outcome. A very large fold had formed right above the new tubing that was added to reinforce the aft section. Now this sure looks like a failure to me for a few reasons. What do you think, Zach? Well, it definitely isn't pretty. If they added that additional reinforcement before the test, does that mean that they knew that this was going to happen? Well, yeah, I guess it could. Either they knew something had the possibility of happening, or they knew something was going to happen for sure and wanted to contain it. You said this extra reinforcement wasn't on Booster 4 or Booster 5, right? Yeah, that, that is correct. So since this appears to be something that was necessary, is it possible that they could have added them as a retrofit if they wanted to? Well, the issue probably could have been fixed with some modification to Booster 4, 5, and 6's aft sections, but it would have taken some work for sure. They probably would have had to add more stringers below the existing ones, reinforcing the area where the buckle formed. And this wouldn't have exactly been easy with the COPVs and hydraulic power units. But they didn't do that. Well, yeah. I, I think I see where you're going with this. I mean, this is pure speculation. But it seems like this was probably another big reason why SpaceX moved on from Booster 4 and 5. I believe that without this additional reinforcement, it's likely that Booster 4's aft section would have been crushed during Max-Q, or possibly even as soon as it left the pad. The reason I say that is because at this point, there's more than 5,000 tons of propellant that must be supported by the aft section. At the moment of ignition and throttle up, there will also be 7,500 tons of force from the 33 Raptor engines pressing upwards. This could theoretically crush the bottom of the LOX tank. Honestly, yeah, that's sort of been one of my interpretations for this as well. This is a pretty significant structural failure, and we have good reason to believe that this was a failure, because if you look at the brand new thrust sections on Booster 7 and onwards, they have the same fixes that I described earlier with the extra stringers. It sure doesn't seem like a coincidence that they added stringers over the area that failed on B2.1. Wow. Well, knowing all of this, I'm kind of glad that Booster 4 never launched. What do y'all think? Let me know your opinions in the comments. This was a very major turning point in the Starship program. SpaceX would soon abruptly retire Ship 20 and Booster 4 in favor of Ship 24 and Booster 7. This decision involved moving up the schedule on a complete rework of the ground support systems, integration of the new Raptor 2 engines, and most importantly, the addition of a sliding door on the payload bay of the Starship. That last one especially is a pretty big deal as it relates to structural qualification testing. In part two, we will be discussing SpaceX's journey to structurally qualify the newly revised vehicles. As SpaceX wanted to press towards an orbital flight as quick as possible, they had to move fast. And that resulted in some pretty significant complications, which we will discuss then. If you enjoyed part one of this deep dive investigation, then do us a favor and hit that like button. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. 
If you would like to support the channel and help us continue to bring you more content like this, then please consider leaving us a super thanks or donating via the PayPal link in the description. For those of you who would like to gain access to the CSI Starbase Discord server, you can do so by becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon. Thank you to everyone who has donated to the ongoing camera upgrade fund and all of our YouTube and Patreon members. Your support is greatly appreciated. Oh, and shout out to everyone who sent birthday wishes this week on Twitter or elsewhere. I definitely felt the love. I want to say a huge thank you to Chameleon Circuit, Lab Padre, NASA Spaceflight, RGV Aerial Photography, Starship Gazer, Maria Pointer, Cosmic Perspective, The Everyday Astronaut, and all the other Starbase photographers and 3D artists whose content was used in this episode for all of their hard work documenting the Starship program. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. You can find links to all of their various channels in the description. All right, everyone. We'll see you all next time. For now, this is Stage Zero Zach, signing off.